like take a moment to practice relating because we can read and read and read and watch movies and study books and do all of these things. We can make ourselves feel bad all we want to, but it's not going to bring good in the world. No one here can feel bad enough to bring good into the world. So what can we do? How can we relate? Be daring, be bold, or I'm going to call somebody out. Okay. What's the story of your name? Uh, when I saw it initially, I heard Pedro Silva? Oh, that sounds like a Brazilian name. Oh, it does sound like a Brazilian name. My dad's Cape Verdean. Okay. So that's where my name comes from, which I think I'm going to jump off of that and say, oh, my daughter has her hand up. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm going to jump off of that, actually. Thanks for the question. And then I'm going to tell you all something that I've observed. I'm just going to be honest with you. I've seen people see me, see my blackness, embrace, you know, they'll just like brace up. And then I'll say, hey, um, yeah, my name is Pedro Silva. And as soon as they hear me say Pedro, they lighten up because some of their projections of what it means to be a black person in America dissolves and they get curious. But because my name is Pedro, I get something that's afforded to me by society that is diluted by an illusion of people's worth. So I don't know if you thought I was going to say all that when I said my, you asked about my name, but I'm just going to share it and tell you. And that's something we have to witness in ourselves or we can't clean it up. We can't, we can't shine our lights. So I don't know. You, you let me know when I should stop. <laughs> all right. Do you really have a question, Makaya? Okay, my daughter raised her hand, but then she put it down. <laughs> Any other questions, thoughts? Yes. I'm not sure who said this. It might have been Martin Luther King Jr., but the 11 o'clock is a segregated hour of the week. Yep. I mean, that's absolutely true. But it's. Oh, yeah, okay, I'll repeat that. She's, um, they lifted up that Martin Luther King said that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, or 10 15 in this case, is the most segregated hour in our country. Um, because people come to church and their churches kind of mirror, you know, the church is maybe mostly white and mostly black and all these other things. And I would say, yeah, that's that's still a fact. That's still the case. You know, um, I think that it just reflects uh, a lot of different things about how we relate and our um, association with being comfortable because a lot of us want to feel comfort. And I know that sometimes in worship, they say that uh, the job of the preacher is to uh, afflict the, what is it? Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. It's actually, that's, that's the statement that they say. It's actually, uh, the person who really wrote that was, uh, I can't remember his name now, but it was a reporter who said that the job of a reporter is to afflict the comfortable and uh, comfort the afflicted. And he was saying it as a joke, facetiously. Um, but so it happens that that's the case, that a lot of us want to feel comfortable. And so, I mean, I'll use myself again as an example. I grew up in uh, like all black churches, uh, evangelical and things like that. A lot of speaking in tongues, which I don't anticipate we're going to see today. Um, different things, right? And I was very attached to that worship experience. So even when I started having a different um, kind of disposition of where I felt called, how to, how to share the ministry that was in me that didn't reflect um, what was happening in the church, church I was in at the time, I, uh, I was attached to the worship style. And so I, it took me a, a little bit of time to be able to move out of that worship style and let go of the attachment of that worship style. And, um, and um, really in my spiritual life, I prayed and I asked God about it because um, it was hard. And it basically said to me, oh, you're making an idol out of a worship service. You're making an idol out of a worship service. You, you want a worship service to be a certain way because it, you're used to it and you're worshiping worship services instead of worshiping God. And so I said, oh, shoot, well, I don't want to do that. Um, and so then I decided to let it go and to see where God called me to be and just show up. Um, and then God tricked me, and then I ended up saying, like, well, okay, well, there you go. And I got some more work to do. So, yes, it's true. I think it is based in comfort, and it's based in, uh, you know, wanting to feel. Uh, most of us want to be good people. I, I think most humans, even people that don't show it, want to be good people, and we feel good when we're comfortable. And so we look for spaces. Um, but I think that we're increasingly called to be better people. And to be better, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. Just like you can go to the gym. And if you want to get stronger, you got to work out. You got to be uncomfortable. You can't just go to the gym and say, I want to be buff. I know because I try. I do it all the time. I'm like, I want to be buff. Take it. I got to go to the gym. So there it is. So, yes. How do I stay curious? Or how do, how do I recommend other people to do it? Okay. First of all, I like correcting my mistakes, and I said I was going to be the only black person y'all saw, and uh, I was actually wrong because there's more than one black person here. There you go. I admit that. And uh, sometimes being, it's being curious is being open to learning all the time, being willing to allow mistakes to be a part of the process. In our context of America, we are so ashamed of making mistakes. It's really ridiculous. It makes no sense that we're this way. Um, I think it's a condition. I don't throw the word white supremacy out there lightly because it's a confusing term. It like really is. Um, but there's a system that says you cannot make mistakes. It's based in our manufacturing uh, processes in our society where you're supposed to minimize variation. And so when people, when you go to work, you're actually practicing a behavior. And so at work for a generation, especially in the manufacturing space, people practice a behavior, minimize variation, minimize variation, minimize, minimize variation, maximize productivity, maximize um, 
just output. And so that's how we've been structured. And so now when we end up doing things in our day to day life, we think we can't make mistakes. And, and then we, if we can't make mistakes, we can't learn. Most mistakes come through the process of learning. And so when you're being uncomfortable, being, being able to witness yourself making mistakes and being curious enough about those mistakes to know that it's actually increasing your capacity for learning is a way to do it. It's just like, I mean, you look, you work out sometimes. I don't know if you do, but I'm assuming you look like you work out. Yeah, see, okay. So I imagine when you're working out, when you feel that little bit of pain, you actually feel a little bit of pride, a little bit, like that good kind of pride, like yeah, it hurts, I was working out. That's, that's kind of how it is. You know, when you're going through this discomfort, you're also learning, you're also getting better. But if you don't want, if you want to avoid that, you're not going to experience it. And so that's like what I do when I'm, when I'm like learning and making mistakes and I collect mistakes like they're prizes. I'm like, yes, I was wrong, you know, but that's not how our system is set up. Um, but we aren't called to fit into the system. None of us are fit, are called to conform and to fit into the system. There's a reason for systems, but then, but we, like Jesus said about the Sabbath, he's like Sabbath was created for humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. Systems were created for us, not us for the systems. So if the system stops serving us, we had to transform those systems so that they serve more people and serve us all better. And that's something that can only happen by admitting that we're making mistakes and admitting that we need learning. We got things, that we, there's things that we don't know. Two terms I've been sharing with people a lot lately is intellectual humility and cultural humility. And that's being able to say, like, I don't know about this culture and I don't understand what you're telling me so that I can learn. So that's, uh, thanks for that question um, about how do you maintain curiosity when you're uncomfortable? And um, I'll say like one more maybe? Yeah. One more? And if there's no more, then no more. I know somebody, is anybody here who has a cause? Okay, there you go, thanks. Okay, so uh, she lifted up that um, with all, George Floyd, she saw how bad things are. There's a lot of learning and things that are happening, but what can we do on a practical level? Um, one of the things I say is uh, talk, like talking is not doing nothing. I use a double negative on purpose because sometimes people feel like talking is like, yeah, we're just talking. But if you're talking and it's making you uncomfortable, then it's doing something. So there's a lot of things out there. The work I do now, I work for an organization called Unify and it's spelled Y-O-U-N-I-F-Y. Um, the reason why I spell that way, one is that you are identifying yourself, your gifts, your, your place in the world, and then how you fit into unifying what's this world that is inherently unified, but bringing that into your awareness. And we do that in a lot of ways. Um, some of them are convening conversations across differences um, and seeking opportunities to do that, to talk to people that are different from you. And if you feel yourself being scared and also do it, like there's a book I read a long time ago, it's called Feel, feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. That's, I think, the number one uh, bit of advice is to feel the fear and do it anyway. To be able to say like, if you see yourself being scared, don't run in the other direction because then you're being led by fear instead of being led by love. And the teachings of the scriptures that we practice says that um, there is no fear in love, that perfect love casts out fear. And so seek perfect love in all that you do so that it can cast that fear out because that perfect love is the light of who we are. But we have to be able to go toward that. And it, it's different for different people. Like some people, they may be called to go out and they may be, you know, march or protest. Some people may be called to donate resources to things that they believe are bringing the good about in the world that they want to see done. Some people are going to be having conversations with somebody in your family, which is probably the biggest contribution. Uh, the biggest contribution is talking to people in your family that you're scared to talk to because you want to keep the peace. Because Jesus didn't say blessed are the peace keepers. He said blessed are the peacemakers. And you can't make peace in a world that is rife with dissension. You can't just be, and, and say, I'm going to keep the peace. It's, there is actually not peace. You know, there's the illusion of peace. Real peace comes when we engage and we open ourselves up and we create. We create it by creating systems and processes and things that invite in more, that help people to relate, that own up to people's mistakes. I told my kids plenty of times, whether they listen to me or not, you know, we make mistakes and it's okay because we get better every day. Very simple. We make mistakes, but it's okay because we get better every day. So I would invite you, make mistakes, learn from them, keep going and uh, trust that you have tools and people and resources to be able to live into the person that God already created, created you as in the first place. So, blessings and thanks for engaging.